Road School of Public Policy, known to many of you as Geopolitics. My name is Sneha Puri, and I am a second year Master of Public Policy student in the McCord School of Public Policy. I serve as the graduate chair of the Geopolitics Student Advisory Board and have also been involved with geopolitics over the past year through the Fellows Program and various other speaker events. As a policy student, I have a profound interest in studying trust in government because I believe it is a cornerstone of effective policy making. I recognize the particularly critical role of trust in government in today's complex political landscape and hope to learn more about it from our guest tonight. It is, my, it is these passions that make it my distinct pleasure to introduce our guest tonight, who is the former White House Chief of Staff, Ron Klain. Ron. <laughs> Ron draws on four decades of experience in law, finance, policy making, and politics to advise clients across industries on national and international legal issues, crisis management, and the global regulatory environment. Having served as a key advisor to three US presidents, most recently as White House Chief of Staff in the Biden-Harris administration, Ron is sought after when stakes are at their highest. During his time as White House Chief of Staff, Ron oversaw the administration's COVID-19 response and contributed to major legislative accomplishments, including the American Rescue Plan Act, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the Chips and Science Act, and the Inflation Reduction Act. His long history of public service includes serving as assistant to President Bill Clinton and chief of staff and counselor to Vice President Al Gore. Earlier, he served as associate counsel to President Clinton and then counselor to the US Attorney General. He subsequently served as the senior aide to President Barack Obama and chief of staff to then Vice President Biden. Ron is also a fellow Hoya, graduating from Georgetown's College of Arts and Sciences in 1983 with a bachelor's in government. He came back to Georgetown years later to serve as an adjunct professor. Ron returns to the Hilltop tonight to discuss restoring trust in government and will pull back the curtain on navigating today's political climate. Tonight's conversation and Q&A will be moderated by Executive Director of Geopolitics, Mo Elidi. Georgetown University is committed to standards promoting speech and expression that foster a maximum exchange of ideas and opinions. Whilst it is recognized that audience members may not share the same views as the speaker, it is expected that everyone in attendance at this event will respect the right of the speaker and the organizer of tonight's event to share their perspectives and ideas and not cause a disruption in the event's activities. There will be an opportunity for Q&A during which you may engage in dialogue with the speakers. Please be sure to phrase your comments in the form of a question. In the interest of time, we ask that each person be concise and only ask one question. Also, please join this evening's conversation on social media by tagging geopolitics using at geopolitics and the hashtag claim at geo. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming to the stage Mo Elidi and Ron Klain. Neha, thank you so much for the warm welcome and for your leadership on the Student Advisory Board. Look at this crowd. This is awesome for the start of the, yeah. the semester. Hoya Saxa, everyone. Yeah. And Hoya Saxa, Ron. Thank you. Thank you all for the warm welcome. Ian, even if the crowd is just here to get some air conditioning on a hot night, I appreciate everyone being here and look forward to the conversation. Thank you all. Um, we're going to get into a lot of stuff tonight. Um, underneath this umbrella theme of restoring trust in government. I've known Ron for many years. I, I was gonna call you a mentor, but I just heard you tell a group of students in our office that having a mentor is overrated, so I can't, I don't feel like I can call you that anymore. <laughs> but um, this guy's done just about everything worth doing in government and in politics. You know, we're the Institute of Politics and Public Service. A lot of people come here because they like politics. A lot of people come here because they like public service. I like to focus on the word and because you can't really have one without the other. The two have to coexist. Few people understand that better than Ron. And so we're going to talk about a lot of those themes. But what I want to start with is, you know, there's no one that bleeds Hoya blue like this guy does. And so I want to kick it off with a question, Ron. Would you say your Georgetown education was entirely or mostly responsible for all of your professional successes? 
Well, I'd say, mo I'd say almost entirely uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, I got an amazing education here at Georgetown, had incredible professors, and um, really learned so much about government and philosophy and uh, political theory and all kinds of things like that that really have served me throughout my career. Uh, secondly, on the very first day I moved into Darnell Hall, I met my wife, who, uh, whose campaign for student government president I ran successfully, and it taught me a lot about politics too. And uh, she's been a, a, a great friend and partner for the uh, f nearly 40 years we've been married. Uh, we met 44 years ago on August 24th. Um, and so, um, so virtually everything that's good that's happened to me in life has happened because I went here to Georgetown. We'll, we'll hope that the student questions later don't break that streak um, yeah. for you. Um, okay, you have worked in all three branches of government. You have advised uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee where you first started working for your most recent boss. You have advised three presidents. You have coordinated the federal government's response to not one but two major public health crises, the Ebola response under President Obama and the COVID response at the beginning of the Biden administration. So you have a unique perspective on the importance of trust in government. Yeah. Pew Research has been tracking public trust in government for decades. When they first started tracking it in 1958, about three quarters of Americans said they trusted government. In 2022, that number was down to two in 10. And it's been hovering around that number going back to the second Bush administration. Yeah. Why? Well, I think a number of factors. I think one, um, for people our age, I think trust in government declined with uh, the war in Vietnam. That seemed like a debacle uh, that the government mismanaged and had all kinds of excuses for the failures of. Uh, the Watergate scandal, I think, changed how we saw government and whether or not we could trust our leaders. I think for a younger generation, uh, the so-called forever wars in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, also contributed to that lack of trust and that sense that the government didn't know what it was doing. Uh, I think that added to that sentiment. And I think more recently, um, you know, I think that, uh, I think you take all that and you add to it the general polarization in our country right now, the division that's fed in part by social media and other factors, and you have a formula for distrust in government. President Biden said in his inaugural address that the most important thing he wanted to do was restore faith in democracy by showing that democracy could work. And he got to work on that by uh, managing a COVID response that got everyone in America who wanted to get vaccinated a chance to be vaccinated uh, much faster than experts said that was gonna happen. And by restoring US leadership around the world and, uh, and by achieving some powerful legislative successes. I think he really wanted to show to the American people and to the world at large that a democratic country could still deliver change. And you know, when he became president, there was a view in some circles that you needed an autocratic system like China's to effectively, ma effectively manage complex changes and that democracy was too unruly, too divisive, too rambunctious to possibly achieve uh, structured strateg strategic change. And the president rejected that and said that no, in fact, that our democratic values and, our, and, and, the, and the, 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 the robustness of our democracy was a strength we had as a country, not a liability. And we were gonna show that to the American people and show that to the world, and we did. I think by passing the rescue plan that got Americans back to work and got everyone vaccinated, and then passing the infrastructure bill, which is remaking America's infrastructure and getting us ready to compete in the years ahead. The Chips and Science Act, which is reshoring the production of semiconductors here to the United States. And finally, the Inflation Reduction Act, which uh, is putting the U.S. at the lead on fighting climate change by powering a, a job creating clean energy transition here in the United States with jobs being created in wind power, solar power, all kinds of alternative energy and the construction of electric vehicles and their batteries. So, uh, you know, I think people have to see the government produce results. The problems are obvious. You, you know, I mean, I know there are climate deniers, but in general, you just have to look outside and see the evidence of climate change all around us. 
And the question people were asking was, would the government ever do anything about it? Could it, could it overcome uh, the power of special interests to actually act and do something about it? And President Biden achieved that with the help of his allies on Capitol Hill. And hopefully that restores some people's faith in the idea that our system can work, it can produce results, can make the country and the world a better place. And that's what he's been working on as president, I think success with some success. So I wanna pull on a few different threads there, but yeah. it's interesting, there's, there's a major survey that's conducted every year that, that gauges globally trust in institutions. And for the first time in the most recent iteration of it, more people who lived under authoritarian regimes said they trusted their government than those who lived under Western democracies. Now you gotta take that with a grain of salt because like if I'm living in an authoritarian yeah. country and someone calls me and says, do you trust the government? Like I can't really say no yeah. on the phone. But it was the first time that we saw that democratic regimes were falling behind authoritarian regimes on that question. And so I guess, how big of a problem is this really? Is it, you, you just went through a whole litany of accomplishments. Governing can still take place. How big is the problem of public mistrust in government? Look, I think it's a big problem that President Biden has tried to address and has some success in addressing. I, I think the people who uh, have faith in autocracies need to look at what's happening in China right now, where their economy is flatlining even as our economy is growing, where they've come out of the COVID response chaotically with mass deaths and, and, and deep economic problems, and, uh, and ask yourself if that's a more effective system. It doesn't seem like it is in any way, shape, or form. Um, and, so, uh, and so look, I, I think there is a problem with trust in government, uh, trust in authority. We've seen a big debate in our country about science uh, in the context of the COVID response. We obviously have had a lot of vaccine resistance and doubt of scientific expertise around the COVID response and other issues, climate. And so that's, that's a problem. And I think that, the, I think in the Biden theory, the answer is show the people results. Uh, show, the, show the people that the government can deliver. It can build bridges, it can build roads, it can connect people who don't have internet to broad, high speed internet. It can uh, move us into this clean energy transition that creates a lot of jobs and makes our air cleaner and, and preserves our planet. And I think those results will help restore some of, the, some of the trust in government, but it will take a time. This crisis of trust in government didn't happen overnight as your earlier question alluded to. It's been a multi-decade problem and it's not gonna get fixed overnight. You, t you talk about polarization as being part of the problem. In that Pew survey, only 9% of Republicans right now say they trust government but only 29% of Democrats say they do, yeah. right? So, and the true is reverse when there's a Republican president. Under the Trump administration, only 14% of Democrats said they trusted government, but only 21% of Republicans did. And so talk a little, because <laughs> the mistrust seems to be, the, the mistrust in government seems to be one of the few things that we all agree on, you know, as Americans. So well, talk about polarization. Yeah, look, context. I think also government is a broad phrase that covers a lot of different things. I was just talking, I just did an interview for the Fly podcast, and we were talking about this. Uh, one of the institutions that's most lost the trust and confidence in the American people is the Supreme Court. And so when you ask a lot of those Democrats, they have trust in government, and they say no. I think a lot of that distrust is centered around the Supreme Court and its recent ultra-conservative rulings. And so, um, you know, people look at that as the government, understandably. It is the government. It's obviously not the Biden administration, but it is the government. Um, and uh, I understand why a lot of people who care about individual liberties and freedoms and equality uh, have distrust in the Supreme Court and it's in its dedication to those things. And I think it adds to that on the, on the side of the Democrats there. And um, so I think, you know, we, we have, um, you know, a divided government in the sense we have a very conservative Supreme Court and, uh, you know, a Democratic president and a Democratic House, a Democratic Senate and a now Republican House. And so when you ask me, do I trust the government? The question is, who are you asking me about? And uh, you know, it's, it's a complicated question. Let's talk about some key um, issues that you faced in your most recent tour in the White House. And then I wanna talk a little bit about some of the rifts that I think are, are driving some of this. Um, and look, I, I believe, and I think you would probably agree with this, that in part the 2020 election 
between Joe Biden and Donald Trump was not as much a referendum on, on COVID or a referendum on the economy. It was more of a referendum on chaos, right? 2020 yeah. was just a very chaotic, tumultuous period. And Joe Biden won in part because he was portraying himself as, you know, well, let's bring the grownups back in yeah. the room and put an end to this chaos. And you guys had to deal with a lot of big things. Let's start with COVID. When you were running the Ebola response, as you'll know, 58% of people said they trusted the government's response to the Ebola, the Ebola outbreak. COVID seemed to be one of a very polarizing issue, whether it was yeah. because of mandates or how long should the schools be open or, you know, uh, whatever. How, you know, can I even go to a restaurant? It became very polarizing. Talk a little bit about how you guys tackled it and within sort of this context of restoring the public's trust during this major crisis. Well, I'd say, um, you know, Ebola, we had a big challenge in helping the countries of West Africa fight Ebola there, but we had only one case of acquired Ebola in the United States. And uh, if you have only one case, it's easy to build the public trust in the idea that we're doing a, doing a good job. Um, and so, um, you know, our major focus was on trying to help the countries of West Africa fight the virus and defeat it and keeping it from being imported to the U.S. from West Africa. And in the course of doing that, President Obama made some very hard choices. First ever deployment of U.S. troops and a public health response. We, Operation United Assistance sent 3,000 troops to West Africa to help build the infrastructure of the Ebola response there and help uh, distribute medical supplies and and other th things that were needed to fight Ebola in West Africa. But um, uh, so I think, I think you know, we, we, we ran a good response. We saved a lot of lives in West Africa. When we started the Ebola response, people were projecting there'd be a million deaths. Uh, there were about 50 or 60,000. That's still a horrible tragedy. It was a horrible time in West Africa, but obviously 50 or 60,000 isn't a million. And I think that's because of a lot of, of the intervention of the United States, France, UK, and, other, and the African Union other countries and the courage of the people of West Africa taking on this disease. So many people there volunteering for dangerous work to fight the disease. It was a tremendous success in that way. Uh, COVID, we saw something else, right? We saw the, the, the virus first came to our country uh, when Donald Trump was president. We had a lot of kind of denial and him saying he doesn't like to count the cases because then the case count goes up and, uh, and a distrust of science and, and a lot of confusion about it. And, um, and no real plan to, they, the, I give President Trump credit, Operation Warp Speed did a good job of developing a vaccine very quickly, but then they had no plan to distribute the vaccine. So we came in, we had millions of doses of vaccine. We didn't have enough vaccine. We had to go out and make a plan to buy more vaccine. And then we had to get it distributed to the American people. And, um, you know, and I think in some ways um, that became, um, so easy to get vaccinated that people didn't really give us credit for much of an accomplishment there when in fact we were headed towards a, a catastrophe as a country if we hadn't straightened out the vaccine distribution program. Um, uh, is there, a tr there was a trust problem obviously. We had vaccine hesitancy, that's not a new problem in America. Every time there's been a new vaccine, there's been vaccine hesitancy. Uh, when the polio vaccine came out, it took years to get people vaccinated because of resistance to the polio vaccine. Uh, those of you who read any history of this know there a famous, a famous event of uh, Elvis Presley going on the Ed Sullivan Show to get vaccinated. That was seven years after the vaccine was first introduced in the United States. That's how long it took to get you know, people uh, acclimated to getting vaccinated for polio. Um, so uh, there's always vaccine resistance. This time it was, I think, a little more politically polarized and um, you know, more associated with um, you know, political division in our country. And uh, it's a shame, it shouldn't have been that way. Um, you know, President Trump deserves credit for getting the vaccine uh, to, uh, through the development stages. And I don't know why, why getting vaccinated became a, a partisan issue. Because when we won the election in 2020, I understood that masking was a partisan issue. I understood that there were reasons why people didn't like masks and it had divided along party lines. I totally understood that, but I couldn't imagine once we had a vaccine that was proven safe and effective, there would be people who would say, I don't want that. Um, but we obviously had a lot of that and still, still, still do. I 
could keep talking about COVID, but I want to talk about a few other things as well. Um, there was probably no point that really crystallized. The president was in the first, the beginning of the administration had pretty solid approval numbers until the withdrawal from Afghanistan. And that's when we started to see a precipitous decline in his approval numbers. And I think when a lot of people said, okay, you said you were gonna be the grownups in the room, what just happened? Explain, talk a little bit about that. Well, look, I think, um, you know, we inherited an agreement between the Trump administration and the Taliban that said we had to be out by May 1st. And that had led to a false sense of, of, um, of being in Afghanistan was easy because the Taliban had agreed to stop attacking U.S. troops as long as we agreed to leave by May 1st. So um, people thought you could just leave our troops there and they'd be perfectly fine. But uh, the Taliban made it clear if we didn't honor the agreement to leave, they would resume their attacks on U.S. troops and we'd have to send more troops to Afghanistan. President Biden uh, believed firmly that four of his predecessors had managed a war in Afghanistan. He wasn't going to pass it on to a fifth one. Uh, he would be the fifth and he wasn't going to pass it on to a sixth one. And, um, and he had run on a promise to end the war in Afghanistan. We've been at it for 20 years. We originally had gone to um, um, bring Osama bin Laden to justice. He'd been brought to justice a decade ago, and we were still there. And, um, uh, and it seemed like the purpose of our being there kept changing all the time. Uh, and the president thought that uh, it was a, a that the men and women of our armed forces shouldn't have to go there, shouldn't have to fight, shouldn't have to risk their lives, that our mission to, uh, to bring al-Qaeda to justice had, had prevailed, and that it was time to end our presence in Afghanistan. He also believed that we had other challenges as a country, um, and, uh, and that, that you know, continuing to send Americans overseas to Afghanistan to fight, and potentially the risk of having to send more and more Americans as the, if the Taliban resumed its attacks, was a mistake, was a misuse of our resources. And so he made a decision to end the war and he announced that to the American people. Uh, then the question is what happens to, and, and we got all of our troops out and, they all, and initially they all got out safely. And then the question is what do you do with all the civilians in Afghanistan who had been helpers to US armed forces, who were dissidents against uh, the Taliban uh, and who would be at risk once, once the Taliban took over the country. And, um, and so in August, uh, the, the, the Afghan government didn't want us to have a mass evacuation because they thought if we had a mass evacuation, it would collapse the Afghan government, which so a lack of confidence, it would show that people were fleeing the country. And so, uh, but in August, as the Taliban marched towards Kabul, the president ordered a civilian evacuation of, Afga of Kabul. And we sent uh, 6,000 troops back into Kabul to secure uh, the airport there and the area right around the airport so we could run an evacuation. And what happened was, although I know it looked chaotic, and it was in many respects, the most successful humanitarian evacuation in the history of the world. We got 120,000 people out of Kabul in about two weeks. Um, I know there are people who were left behind who wanted to leave. Uh, there are millions of people in Afghanistan. If millions of them wanted to leave, I understand that. But you know, we, we tried to prioritize the people who had directly helped our troops and the people who were most at risk from a Taliban regime. And we got a lot of them out. Now, near the end of that evacuation, uh, we had a horrible instance where there was a terrorist attack on one of the gates of the airport. And on August 26, 2021, we lost 13 U.S. service men and women and had others who were severely injured. And that was the darkest day of the Biden presidency, uh, the darkest day of, of my public service. Um, and uh, uh, it was trage a tragedy. But those heroes, those 13 heroes, uh, we're part of a mission that ultimately did save 120,000 people from Taliban rule and got them out of the country. And in the end, we got everyone else after that day. All, all of the members of the armed forces were still serving in Kabul. We got them all out safely and all back home safely. So um, it was a very difficult mission. The military did an excellent job of executing the mission. Um, I remember the first day of the evacuation, uh, a very famous CNN reporter stood on the runway in Kabul and said, there's no way these people can get 50,000 people out. And, uh, and we got 120,000 people out. So uh, I, give, I give our generals great credit for that, General McKenzie and others who organized it. Uh, it was a very, very difficult mission to fly uh, a number of planes, some military planes, a lot of civilian planes in and out of that airport with um, you know, terrorist threats all around the airport. And the pilots who flew those missions 
and the crew members who staff those missions are heroes. And, um, and I think that was, uh, you know, we, we saved a lot of people that way. So, but I want to be clear. I don't, I don't think it was a mistake at all to end the war in Afghanistan. I think it was the right decision to end the war. It had gone on for 20 years. And um, the U.S. had spent almost a trillion dollars, lost thousands of lives uh, fighting in Afghanistan. And it really wasn't clear anymore what the, what the objective was. So I want to read a question that a friend of mine sent. This is a longtime Republican Hill staffer. Um, who I don't agree with. He and I have done a lot of battle in political wars over the years, but uh, I respect him. And he wanted, he suggested I ask this question. I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit. Doesn't restoring trust in government mean acknowledging mistakes? We know President Trump would never do so, but the Biden team are self framed as the adults in the room. If the CDC can't say we messed up a lot of guidance, or the education secretary can't say we left schools closed too long, rather than acting like it all went according to plan, doesn't that make it harder to bring people back into the fold? And so I asked that question right after we talked about the COVID response and the Afghanistan withdrawal, because I think that is how a lot of people on the opposite side of the aisle, and I think we could do the same exercise if I was talking to uh, Mick Mulvaney right now about the Trump administration, this whole notion of when making mistakes is part of the problem that, you, it, that government so rarely owns up to them. Well, I think, I think uh, we always try to own up to our mistakes. I will say on the schools, um, you know, President Biden got the schools open. When he became president, most schools in this country were closed. And be, by the next fall, most schools in the country were open. So I'm not going to own the mistake of keeping the schools closed when we were the ones who got the schools open. Now, how did we do that? Uh, the, the, there were Republicans running around saying, just yell at the teachers more. Just yell at them more and tell them to go back to school. What we did instead was we prioritized teachers for vaccinations. We put them at the front of the line. We got teachers vaccinated. It's not a surprise that teachers didn't want to go back to the classroom if they didn't feel safe. Teaching is a very important profession, but people didn't want to risk their own lives. I understand that. And by uh, not yelling at teachers, but working with them to get them vaccinated, we got teachers back in the classroom. We got the schools open. So, um, so if, if, if someone kept the schools closed, they, they should own up to that. But that wasn't us. Um, and... Uh, uh, I hear this all the time about COVID. You know, I hear President Trump, former President Trump talk about you know, the, the lockdowns, lockdowns. Lockdowns happened while he was president. Joe Biden was a private citizen when the lockdowns happened. And since he's been president, we've gradually reopened the country. Um, we've done it uh, thanks to getting people vaccinated so they can feel safe to go back to work, go back to school, go back to doing business, go back to restaurants. Um, we know the vaccine isn't perfect in terms of preventing infection, but it does prevent severe illness, and that's given people the confidence to go on with their lives. And by getting it distributed uh, and easily available, um, we, we facilitated that. Also uh, acquiring Paxlovid as a cure for people who uh, aren't vaccinated and even help the vaccinated have less severe cases of COVID has also helped. So um, uh, you know, I'm happy to own mistakes, but I don't think our approach to the schools of the COVID response was a mistake. In about five minutes, we're going to invite you all into the conversation. There are standing mics in either aisle. Feel free to start lining up now. And while you all do, I want to ask a question, uh, Ron, that sort of a politically oriented question. Um, and it's not about the upcoming election per se. But I'm wondering if you have thoughts on political reforms that we can and should pursue that would, as a result, help restore some of the public's trust and faith in government? Well, I'd start with the fact that we make it far too hard to vote in this country. And if you want people to have trust in the government, they have to believe it's a government they elected. And, um, and I think it should be much easier to vote. I think some of the regression we've seen on voting rights, efforts to make it harder to vote by mail or vote remotely, uh, efforts to make it harder to register to vote, I think those, those are a step backwards. Um, you know, I think that uh, we're a democratic republic. We're a republic as, as a form of a democracy, and that rests on the, the, uh, the ability of the American people to choose their leaders. And, uh, and, and you know, I think our country is one of the countries that makes it hardest to vote of any of the major democracies, and uh, we should do voting rights reform to uh, make sure that, um, uh, that people who want to vote 
can get registered and can, and can vote without it being overly challenging. Uh, along that line, I also think uh, redistricting reform is very, very important. Um, you know, there's an old saying that, um, you know, voters should elect their representatives, the representatives shouldn't pick their voters. And we have in too much of this country a place where the, the representatives pick the voters. And we have highly polarized districts, and we have uh, highly skewed districts. And uh, if you look at the state of Wisconsin as an example, Wisconsin's a 50-50 state, Democrat and Republican. We prove that every single presidential election, every major election in Wisconsin, it's evenly divided, but the legislature's two-thirds Republican. Why is that? It's because of, re it's because of gerrymandering. And we need to fix that so that uh, the districts uh, are better reflect um, how the voters actually feel. Okay, let's go to your questions. When I point to you, tell us your name, your school year, where you're from, and then your question in the form of a question. And let's start over here. Hi there, thanks for speaking to us. My name is Paloma Renteria. Uh, I am in my second year in uh, the Public Relations and Corporate Communications program at the School of Continuing Studies. Um, I'm from Dallas, Texas, and my question is, um, I'm starting a new job at the White House on Monday, and a lot of us are seeking similar opportunities. What advice would you give to young people who are beginning their career in government, who are seeking to work toward improving public trust in the government to the extent that they can? Well, my advice would be to do just what you're doing, which is you're here at Georgetown. You came here for a reason. Uh, it's a great school. It's a great school academically, but it is, it is in Washington, D.C. And, um, you know, every summer, the city is crammed full of kids from all the other colleges in America who come here for 10 weeks to get the experience you can have all school year round, which is a chance to work in the government, a chance to work on Capitol Hill or in the executive branch or in a think tank or someplace like that. And it's a unique opportunity that being at Georgetown affords you. So my number one advice would be take advantage of the opportunity you have while you're here. I know you seem very busy. You are very busy. Schoolwork is hard. Uh, you have social lives. You have other things you do, activities on campus. They're all great things to do. But, um, but you have four years here where you're living in Washington. Maybe you will or won't after you graduate. This is a chance to really get a hands-on experience like you're about to get. Second thing I'd say is, um, and that means also taking advantage of programs through GU Politics. We didn't have GU Politics when I went to school here. Uh, but it's, a, it's a, a fantastic addition to the campus and the opportunities to hear people talk and to meet people and to work with the fellows is an exceptional opportunity that's, uh, that really is a once lifetime opportunity to take advantage of it. The third thing I'd say, and Mo was alluding to this at the outset, is um, you know, when people give career advice about politics, there's an obsession with mentors. You need mentors, mentors, mentors. What I'd say is mentors are very overrated because when you're a young person, you get a mentor, they're older. And then as you move through your career, that mentor either dies or retires and isn't that helpful anymore. And You're still around. I'm still here for now. <laughs> um, but what I'd say is your most important relationships you're going to build are with your peers. Because your peers here at Georgetown, here at GU Politics, uh, in, in an internship, your peers are the people who are going to move through your career with you. They're going to be the people who are going to be colleagues of yours for the rest of your life. And they will move up in seniority as you move up in seniority. They'll know the job opportunities that are right for your age and stage. And, um, and so I think building that peer network is really, really vital and really, really important. Uh, I would say a lot of the people who were senior officials with me in the Biden administration, we started together as young staffers in the Clinton administration and you know, all helped each other along the way. And that's, I think that peer network is very, very important. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And congrats on the new job. Congrats. Let's go over here. Hello. Um, I'm Darius Wagner. Um, I'm a freshman in the college I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Um, first, I want to say welcome back to the Hilltop, Mr. Thank Clinton. you, Derek. As we speak so much about restoring trust in government, you have overseen one of the most consequential presidencies in at least our modern lifetimes. So we speak about Inflation Reduction Act and bipartisan infrastructure, but we also speak about issues like postal reform, ocean shipping reform, gun rights, and Respect for Marriage Act, so much that you guys have overseen. So I wondered, how did you maintain such a disciplined team to shepherd through such large piece of legislation in such a hyper-polarized environment as we spoke about today? Well, thanks for that question, Derek. Look, I'm a big believer in team. Um, when you're White House Chief of Staff, you get a lot of blame you don't deserve when things go wrong, and a lot of credit you don't deserve when things go well. So as I listen to Mo talk about these accomplishments, he's really talking about the work of my colleagues at the White House, uh, who I was proud to work with as the Chief of Staff. Um, so I think team is important. Uh, for that team to work, it has to be, there has to be mutual trust and respect. And I think, uh, you know, I think that's a critical thing. 
Um, the second thing I'd say is diversity is vitally important. I put a big emphasis on it in our hiring at the White House. It was the first time ever majority of the White House staff was female. It's the first time ever majority of the White House senior staff was female. We had representation of African Americans and Hispanics. Um, and so, you know, I think building a diverse, trusting team is the key to results in any endeavor in life, particularly in politics and public service. And, um, and uh, uh, the team we had was really first rate. Thank you. Thanks. Go over here. Um, my name is Chris. I'm a junior in the college, majoring in government. Um, I'm proud Rhode Islander in D.C., and I volunteered for Gabe Obama's campaign over the summer. So from personal experience working with Gabe Obama in the White House, can you tell us what kind of congressman Rhode Island will hopefully get come November? Well, I think Gabe's going to do a great job. I, I rarely get involved in primaries because I kind of believe all Democrats are good, and, and uh, I don't like dividing the party. But I did, I did uh, back Gabe early and helped Gabe throughout his campaign, helped raise money for him, helped do public events for him. I think Gabe is going to be a great congressman. He did a fantastic job at the White House. He uh, was Deputy Julie Rodriguez, who ran Intergovernmental Affairs. He helped many cities and states deal with crises. He was the person who would get the call if there was a hurricane someplace. We had to figure out what we could do to help the people in that area. And Gabe was amazing at that work. It didn't matter if the local elected officials were Republicans or Democrats. Gabe made sure we put the full resources of the federal government to work for them. I think he'll bring that to the Congress on behalf of the state of Rhode Island. Uh, I think he'll do a good job of serving the state. I think he'll be a real difference maker in Congress. Thank you. Thanks. Over here. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Mr. Klein. Uh, my name is James Nichols Worley. I'm a freshman in the college from Massachusetts. Um, I want to ask you, you know, a lot of people have credited you, uh, your work in the Biden administration for executing really big ideas and executing them well. What do you think uh, the role is of, you know, sort of filtering out the noise, not just from the traditional media, as you said, but filtering out the noise from, you know, social media, the website formerly known as Twitter. Yeah. So I got criticized by some people for being very active on Twitter. <laughs> and I, I've had uh, some, uh, we have a little club of former White House Chiefs of Staff that we get together every now and then, and a bunch of them said to me, no Chief of Staff should be on Twitter. Um, I found Twitter useful and helpful in a couple ways. One, Twitter is not representative of the country. If you go on Twitter and you read Twitter, you haven't learned what the American people think. You learn what the people on Twitter think. That's a very different thing. But a lot of those people on Twitter are reporters, and it's a good way to assess what they're thinking at any given time. That's helpful in trying to guide White House strategy. Secondly, uh, you know, my view was that Joe Biden would become president because we had a lot of great grassroots supporters around the country. And it's hard to communicate with all of them directly. We have emails and text chains and whatnot, but it's just hard to reach them. And Twitter was a way to reach a lot of those supporters who we weren't going to get to otherwise. So I found Twitter useful that way. It's important, though, to filter out and to, to, to turn out the noise. We had a point in January of 2022 where we had been unable to pass the Inflation Reduction Act or any version of it, and our legislative agenda looked like it was stalled. We lost on voting rights. And there were a lot of people saying that Joe Biden should fire me. And there was a lot of talk in Washington about fire Ron Klain. And uh, I asked the president if I th he thought I should go, and he said no. And, um, and I decided just to ignore it. I will say, uh, for the public record, I've said this before, I stopped reading Politico Playbook. Um, <laughs> because I didn't really read all the snarky things that were being said about myself or other people in the White House. And we came together as a team. We decided really to stick it out, stick together. We didn't have finger pointing. We didn't have second guessing. We, we, we linked arms and, uh, and redoubled our efforts to kind of move the legislative agenda forward, and we got it done. There's a, sto there's a story I love from that period. One of the things when you left the White House that you took, one of your, you say one of your most treasured possessions leaving the White House was a rock, just a rock that was given to you during this period. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so um, I mentioned before Louisa Terrell, who ran legislative affairs um, at the White House and was, did a brilliant job. Um, one day in that tough period, she came into my office and she brought me a little rock. She'd been walking on the beach and she brought back a rock. She said. Uh, you're the rock of this team, and this team is rock solid behind you. And uh, what a tough day, dude. It really meant a lot. And so I kept that rock. It sits in my office now. Um, to have members of your team uh, back you up and, uh, and not point the fingers upward was, um, was the thing I was most proud of. Um, and, um, you know, 
I really was grateful for that kind of uh, loyalty and support from my team. I love that story. Thank you. We're here. Good evening. Uh, my name is Evan Cornell. I am a freshman in the College of Arts and Sciences. I am from High Springs, Florida. My question is, if we were to see a decline in misinformation and disinformation, how large of a jump, if any, would we see an American's trust in government? Look, I think misinformation and disinformation is a challenge. It, it's getting worse, not better. Um, you know, new technology tools make it easier to spread the information and make misinformation look more like real information. This is a challenge for everyone in politics. Um, but I also think culture is a big issue. Uh, I want to go back to the COVID response, the Ebola response. I remember during the Ebola response, we had a challenge. The way Ebola, most Ebola was spreading in West Africa was due to burial practices. Uh, there was a burial practice, of, of, a cultural burial practice of washing bodies. And Ebola is most contagious when someone dies. The body expels the virus. And so people were getting it at these funereal observations. And we would send experts into communities and say, hey, don't wash the bodies. And, and it still continued. And, um, and people would come to me and say, this is crazy. How come people over there don't accept the science? They don't accept the, the information? How, you know, how come there's such distrust and, and, and you know, whatnot? And I, and, as this was going on, we had a measles outbreak in Orange County, California, because people weren't getting their kids vaccinated for measles. And I was like, look, before we start to judge other cultures and their, their acceptance of information and expertise, we should look at our own. And now, of course, we saw that spin even more out of control with COVID. So um, we found in West Africa was it required trusted messengers. It wasn't just the messages. It wasn't just putting out PSAs saying, stop washing the bodies. It was having religious leaders uh, to say to their followers, look, this isn't part of our religion, you don't have to do this, um, and uh, we shouldn't do this because we're putting ourselves at risk. And so I think that's the challenge with misinformation and disinformation. The response to that has to be not just better messages, but messengers that, 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 invest, that people connect with. We know that from politics, we know that people trust information from their neighbors more than they trust national news. And, they, and, uh, and that's one of the most vexing problems about misinformation is because of social media uh, you know, where before maybe your neighbor could tell you something wrong over the fence post, now the neighbor can put it on Facebook and everyone in the neighborhood can get that bad information. But we need to build up, uh, you know, not just trust in the messages, but trust in the messengers too. Thank you. Is AI going to make this problem better or worse? I think both. I think obviously AI has the potential to generate, um, uh, you know, false, false images that seem real and uh, false messages that seem real. But I also think AI can help sort through uh, some, of this, some, of this, some of the junk on social media and help um, the social media companies better police their platforms too. So I think it's, I think it's an asset and a liability, it's both. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, so my name is Braden. I'm a freshman in college. I'm hoping to major in government. And I'm from South Bend, Indiana. And uh, kind of going off of that, I know you're a Hoosier as well. Um, so what advice would you give to Democrats who are in more like redder states who want to further their own careers, but also want to really like help their own community as well. Well, you know, the situation in Indiana is complex and difficult. Uh, when I when I first got, got in politics, I worked for Birch Bayh in his 1980 campaign, and at that time, the uh, the bastion of the Democratic Party in the state was uh, small automaking towns, towns that made auto components, places like Newcastle, Muncie, Kokomo, Anderson. And the suburban areas around the big cities, the suburban area around Indianapolis was the bedrock of the Republican Party. Now it's almost completely flipped to where those small towns, those small manufacturing towns are now very, very Republican, very red, and the suburbs around Indianapolis have become increasingly Democratic. And I'm trying very hard to help one of my friends who I grew up with, uh, Miles Nelson, get elected mayor of Carmel, Indiana, which is the largest of the suburbs, be the first Democratic mayor there ever. And I think there's, I think there's hope for that. I think that um, even though I didn't do it, I hope people uh, like you, uh, you know, move back to Indiana and help build the Democratic Party there. I think there's real potential for the Democratic Party in Indiana. President Obama carried it in 2008. Uh, we have Democratic mayors in some of the suburban cities outside of Indianapolis now. I think Miles can win this fall uh, and help uh, establish a new generation of Democratic leaders in the state. Obviously, Secretary Buttigieg is, one, is part of that generation of new leaders who did a great job in South Bend and is a powerful national leader. So. You know, I have hope for Indiana to become more of a democratic state. And, um, you know, I think we need, we need good people there working on campaigns and working to get elected. Thank you.
Thank you. Thanks. Go back over here. Hi, uh, my name's uh, Dylan, uh, first year in the MPP program, and I'm uh, from Michigan. Uh, my question is, it uh, seems uh, the biggest problem for the Democratic Party and the Biden administration is communicating the successes they, uh, they managed to achieve, Build Back Better, American Rescue Plan, Inflation Reduction, et cetera. So uh, I'm asking, why do you think that is the case, and uh, what could be done to fix that? So I, don't, I, think, I think when we say it's a communications problem, it oversimplifies a bit. So we passed an infrastructure bill. It was an amazing achievement. I'm proud of that. And thanks to the president's leadership, after decades of promising an infrastructure bill, we finally passed one. So why aren't people happier? Because people don't want an infrastructure bill, they want infrastructure. And so you've got to actually build the bridges and build the roads and connect people to broadband. I don't think you can message your way around that. I don't think you can just say, hey, we passed a bill, you should be happy. People are like, well, my road's still broken and my airport still stinks and Amtrak is still slow. And so I think, you're, I think the credit comes when you actually do the doing, not merely the legislating. Legislating is a major achievement. The president serves tremendous credit for doing that, sticking with it, getting it done on a bipartisan basis. It's a tremendous achievement. But I think you, you can't really expect people to be happy about it until they see the actual results happen. And I think, uh, you know, I think it just takes some time to get, the, get these things going. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, I'm Arthur, a freshman in the college from New York City. Um, so far tonight, we've been talking more about sort of communication um, mistakes and successes. And I've been wondering, um, what factor you thought sort of more ideological rejection of government plays um, in the trust, lack of trust in government. Um, I'm thinking specifically of January 6th and how that sort of plays into this dynamic. Well, I think that what happened on January 6th wasn't just an ideological rejection of government, it was an ideological rejection of democracy. And, uh, and people trying to, to intervene in the peaceful transfer of power, which is the essence of our system. Um, because they didn't accept the result of the election, which was that Joe Biden had won. Um, and so, um, look, I think that we've, al we've always had an anti-government strain in American life. It's always been part of our life. Um, and, uh, and the fact that people are skeptical of government is healthy in a democracy. People should ask hard questions. They should be skeptical. But rejecting democracy itself is not a healthy thing, uh, and that puts at risk everything that's great about this country. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Hello. Um, first of all, thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Arjun Venkatesh. I'm a freshman in the college who plans to major in both history and government, and I'm from Long Island, New York. My question is, is this lack of trust in government based on the view that government and corporations are corrupt? And if so, is the solution like a new progressive era, like the one Theodore Roosevelt ushered in when the same problems happened in like the late 1890s? Well. I think that some of it is a, a view about corruption, some of it is a view about misalignment of interest for whatever reasons. Um, some of it's about a view that people feel like problems aren't being effectively addressed. Um, you know, to me, uh, the gun issue is an example of that. Uh, the vast majority of Americans, even gun owners, believe we should ban semi-automatic assault rifles. We're the only country in the world that has unlimited access to those weapons, and they are responsible for virtually every single mass shooting. And, uh, and we have one almost every single day in this country. And so people don't understand why the government can't do something about it. It's just so obvious. Like people can walk into a school with an AR-15 and kill a lot of innocent people. Why don't we do something about that? And so I think lack of trust in government is, hey, why, why can't you guys do something about that? And President Biden's been trying, but he hasn't had the votes on Capitol Hill to do it yet. Uh, so I think, I think progress on problems is a key part of restoring trust. Uh, and uh, speaking frankly to people is a key part of restoring trust. But I think this point of looking at it through a historical context is interesting because, you know, if you look at a lot of the political speeches that were being given a century ago, you hear some of the same rhetoric. And it's interesting, right? Because a century ago, we were going through a transition from an agricultural-based economy to an industrial-based economy. Now we're going through a transition from an industrial-based economy into an information-based economy. And when you see that kind of wholesale change, it creates all sorts of social and economic and political turmoil that freaks people out. And some would argue government is the slowest to respond to that sometimes. It, it, it's that cultural and social upheaval that I think is one of the biggest challenges for government to tackle. It can tackle the economic upheaval, but how does it, alleviate people's anxiety when they see the world changing yeah. 
so rapidly before their eyes. Well, so I think, I think the cultural anxiety uh, and the economic anxiety may be closely tied in some respects, not all respects, but some respects. For example, we know where a lot of this anxiety is, is in the kinds of towns in India I was talking about, manufacturing towns that once were robust and vibrant, making parts for the auto industry. And so one thing President Biden's tried to do is restore U.S. manufacturing. We've created more manufacturing jobs in these two years than any two-year period since the 1950s by, bringing, by, by manufacturing products for the clean energy economy and, um, and uh, you know, starting to restore chip manufacturing. Why is that important? Because manufacturing, it's a high-skilled job, pays a good wage, but also it often doesn't, most often does not require a four-year college degree. The biggest, the biggest fault line we have in American politics now is between people who have a four-year college degree and people who don't. And, uh, uh, and that fault line uh, is a big dividing line. And you know, part of that may be cultural, part of that may be the people who don't have a four-year college degree think that there's no real economic opportunity for them in this country. President Biden has tackled that frontally by trying to bring back six-figure jobs that don't require a college degree so people can feel economically secure. Um, and we'll see how that, how that does as these plans start to go into effect. We see more and more of those jobs being created. Um, but um, uh, but you know, in terms of a new progressive era, uh, what I'd say is you need a new active era, as we've seen under President Biden, by passing all this legislation, by tackling some of these competition issues, um, you know, uh, cracking down on abusive non-competes, and opening up markets for competition like uh, hearing aids and things like that hopefully uh, ushers in an era where people feel like the government's more aligned with their interests, not just representing the special interests. Thanks for the question. I, my name is Luke Succo. I am a freshman in the SFS, and I'm from Maryland. It seems that in the past decade, there have been a fragmentation of the sources from where people get their news, including both on social media and TV news, individuals getting news about the government from increasingly politically biased sources. To what extent do you think that has contributed to the decline of trust in government, and how can the government continue to give clear communication in the face of this? Well, it's interesting. There's no question that news sources have gotten more fragmented. Uh, most of Americans used to watch, when I started, when I started the White House with President Clinton, most Americans watched the network nightly newscasts every night as the principal source of information. And now, very few Americans watch those newscasts and many more get their news from, variety, from social media. Um, I will say political bias in the media is not anything new. Uh, there used to be newspapers call, you know, named, named Democrat and Republican. There used to be avowedly partisan newspapers that dominated the news. And the era of yellow journalism you know, harkens in terms of the effect of partisan media on public opinion. So I don't think this challenge is new. I think the technology is new and it exacerbates this dynamic. And the fact that we don't have shared sources of information also exacerbates that dynamic. Um, but, um, um, you know, but, but I think that, um, you know, we're gonna continue to see how that develops. And it's a challenge on people who are policymakers, public officials, to try to communicate through that noise and get their messages across to the American people as best they can. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Michelle Mesa. I'm a first year at the McCord School of Public Policy, Master of Policy Management, and before I was a Biden administration uh, appointee uh, at the EPA uh, as a scheduler to Administrator Reagan. Um, I, Departing from the reality that we live in hyper-polarized times, right? Where um, before we used to disagree on the how we do things, big, small government, uh, from policy, ABC, now we disagree on the what. Is climate change real? Is COVID a hoax? So is, it, is there a way to get back to political normalcy? And if so, how do we do that based on the reality of mistrust that is one of the things, mistrust between each other and also between uh, us and the government, uh, when that precisely is one of the things that polarize us. Yeah, great question. So look, I think part of that is, as I said, is showing the American people that the government can produce results, can produce progress on vexing problems. I think that restores trust in the government. I think President Biden trying consistently to work with Republicans when he can 
restores the idea that there, there can be bipartisan achievements and bipartisan work. The infrastructure bill was that, the Chips and Science Act was that. So I think those are important things. I think that uh, continuing to communicate clearly and directly about what the goals are, what the objectives are, what's doing uh, is that. And you know, your former boss, Michael Regan, is a good example of someone who came from a, uh, you know, not really a blue state, kind of a reddish, purplish state, yeah. and had great confidence from both environmental leaders and business leaders in the state for his leadership on the environment. And um, when his name first came to President-elect Biden's attention, we called around, and people just raved about uh, who Michael Regan is now, Administrator Regan. Uh, and so I think public officials can play a big part in this. And people like Michael Regan and Pete Buttigieg can play a big part in this. Uh, but you know, the government has to communicate clearly, correctly, uh, fairly and honestly. There has to be transparency. There has to be an effort to work on a bipartisan basis. And there has to be results. People want to see results. You know, I think for the EPA, we can have a debate. You know, it was created by a Republican president. Um, times have changed, but in the end, if people have toxic waste in their backyard. They want to see that it's cleaned up. And if it isn't, the government is failing. And if it is, the government's producing progress. So that's, a, that's, an, that's I think, an important way to restore trust in the government. Thanks Thank for the you. question. Thank you. We've got time for one more. Sorry for those of you still in line. Hi, uh, my name is Jeremy Kaur. I'm a graduate student at the uh, Environment and Sustainability Management here at Georgetown University. I'm from India, and uh, I want to take your advice on uh, how one should go about implementing policy changes, uh, especially when the your major stakeholders are not very receptive to these changes, and the public opinion is not in favor of these changes. Well, I think we found in the first two years it was important to tell people what results the changes would produce. Um, for example, take climate as an issue. Uh, there have been prior efforts to combat climate change by putting a tax on carbon, uh, by, um, by uh, you know, uh, uh, things like that, and the public saw that as punitive, and they saw that as potentially hurting the economy. So when President Biden developed his climate change plan during the campaign, he said, look, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to start by bringing in organized labor and finding a climate change plan they can support, that they believe will create jobs for them. And, and you've heard the President say many times, when I say climate, I think about jobs. And so emphasizing that climate creates economic opportunities, not economic liabilities, I think was important to getting the support we needed to pass the Inflation Reduction Act and to have public support for the elements of the Inflation Reduction Act was to show that we can work on climate change in, in a way that's also good for the economy in our country. So I think thinking about what are people's objections to a policy, uh, how you can address the policy objectives in a way that minimizes those objections is an important part of effective policy making. Thank you. Thanks. Ron, I want to ask one last question before you go. You and I are a couple of Hoyas who spent most of our careers working in politics and public service. You're speaking to a room full of Hoyas, most of whom will likely go on to work in politics and public service in some form or another. So I want to already ask the career advice question. I want to ask a slightly different question. If you could task every single one of these future public servants to do one thing differently, we talked earlier about mistakes, things differently than the way you and I did them, differently than, pr than previous generations did them, in order to make things better, in order to help bring trust back, what is the one thing you would urge each of them individually to do? I, well, I know you said one thing. I'm going to say two things. That's allowed. OK. The first is uh, I love the name GU politics because I don't think politics is a dirty word. I think politics is a good thing. And I think too often, in our country right now, we kind of consider politics as a bad thing. Politics is a derisive word. I think politics is a good thing. I think believing in democratic exchange and elections as a way to achieve change is a positive thing. Uh, the, the author, Franklin Four, has a new book out today about the Biden administration. I don't agree with everything that's in it, but I think overall it's, it's interesting and a good read. And the thesis of it, he calls Joe Biden the last politician. And the thesis of the book is that Biden came to office with a determination to use politics to produce change. And he was embraced his role in politics in a way that President Obama and President Trump did not. Who, they tried to present themselves as being outside of politics. And Biden uh, openly acknowledges he's a cr creature of the political system and, and had experience in the Senate and whatnot. 
and believed in bringing people to the Oval Office and trying to persuade them and whatnot. And so I think politics is a good thing. I think you should always hold your head up if you're doing politics, whether that's campaigns or public service as a political appointee, whatever. Uh, politics is what makes change possible in a democratic society. And so uh, never feel apologetic or, or head down about the fact that you like politics or you're involved in politics. That's the first thing. The second thing is be more inclusive. I think one problem that my party had um, in, the, in the 90s, in the early 2000s, is we had a lot of grassroots activists who I thought had a lot to offer to the party and our party elites tended to straight arm them and keep them out. And, and um, I think one thing I tried to do as a member of the Biden campaign and as a chief of staff of the White House was to bring in the voices of grassroots activists and to listen to people who hadn't been listened to before. Um, I know it seems odd for me to say this as a person who's very experienced and 62 years old, but people who haven't done it before have good ideas and new ideas and they need to be listened to. They need to be brought to the table and they need to feel included and they need to feel heard and seen. And I think uh, our generation started some of that but we didn't do as well as we should have. I hope a new generation does a better job of being more inclusive as they build teams, as they build campaigns, as they build government teams to understand that some people who haven't been heard before have, have wisdom and have ideas uh, that need to be included and need to be at the table and need to help uh, produce the change we all want to see. Our slogan at the Institute is public service is a good thing, politics can be too. Ron, thank you for living that and every day waking up and believing in that and, the nexus of politics Absolutely. and public service for change. Thank you for coming back to the Hilltop. Thanks for having me, everybody. And don't be a stranger. <laughs> All right. And thank all of you for giving us part of your evening to be a part of this conversation, for helping to lead the conversation. If you haven't signed up for our newsletter, politics.georgetown.edu, you'll find out about all of our upcoming events. The next event is actually tomorrow night, where uh, you'll meet the Fall 2023 GU Politics Fellows. We'll all be on stage together. Um, it's a great class. I think you're going to enjoy it. Uh, that event starts at 4 p.m. where? Eight, in the social room over in the Healy Family Student Center. So thanks to the, our student advisory board for keeping me straight there. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.